Hey everyone, welcome back. We'll now move into our last event of QKI 2021, a presentation by Siobhan Zillis. Now Siobhan is the project director at Neuralink's office of the CEO and has worked with Tesla and OpenAI. She's a fellow at U of T's Cre Creative Destruction Lab and a founder and partner of Bloomberg Beta. She'll be speaking on the future of brain machine interfaces to connect humans and computers. Everyone, please welcome Siobhan. Hey guys, um, I love that intro walk-on music. I kind of want to take that everywhere I go. Um, thank you guys for having me here today. I, as uh, as Max mentioned, so I grew up in Markham, Ontario. Uh, you know, definitely had not thought about AI, AI at all growing up. And actually, it's probably before your guys' time, but there's a band called uh, Our Lady Peace that did this uh, album called The Age of Spiritual Machines. And that led me to read this Ray Kurzweil book on basically like human AI symbiosis. And I think I was 12 or 13 at the time and just like could not get AI out of my head from then onwards. Um, then ended up as, as a Canadian would, you know, played a lot of hockey, ended up taking the SAT, ended up in the US and have basically spent pretty much all of the last decade focused in and around AI unfolding in the world in the, in the best way possible. And so what that looked like for six years was investing in startups that were using AI for net good things for the world and also working with a bunch of nonprofits. Um, and one of those nonprofits was, uh, was open AI. And that's how I ended up meeting. Uh, Elon ended up working, spending two years working on just basically the suite of AI projects in the portfolio. So that was uh, AI trips at Tesla, self-driving, Neuralink, uh, and then OpenAI. And I mean, the, the thing I'm going to talk to you guys about today is Neuralink, which has been like kind of the most fascinating thing I've, and complicated, but like also fascinating thing I've ever encountered in my life, um, which does fold into AI, uh, you, you know, AI unfolding in the best possible way in the world but more from an existential perspective. So, you know, back when I was at Bloomberg Beta, I was really focusing on like applications for good. And as I thought about it more and more, I was like, well, you know, AI is gonna be one of the most fundamentally transformative uh, technologies humanity creates, if not the most. And so we just need to make sure, you know, from a humanity perspective, this, this goes well. Um, and so let me hop over into my presentation. What I'll do is there's gonna be just a ton of content here. I'm gonna try and get through it in 25, 30 minutes and then, essentially give the rest of the time over to uh, questions, because I'm sure there will be some. Um, and just stop me at any time if anything goes squirrely or you can't hear me, but here we go. So just a quick quick primer on, on Neuralink in general. Um, it's like, why are, we, why are we even doing this in the first place? So I think there's a there's both a short term and a long term goal of Neuralink. The short term goal is basically solve important brain and spine problems with a seamlessly implanted device. And you know this is definitely easier said than done. Uh, your brain is a very sensitive organ that has a whole bunch of things around it that historically just has never been messed with. You know we've been doing invasive things in medicine for you know many hundreds of years, but definitely not not dealing in the brain region because it's it's the trickiest task you, you can you can possibly choose for yourself. So. That's definitely the short-term goal. And you know, if you think about it, every single component of your reality, everything you've ever touched, any memory you've ever had, anything you've ever felt, like all of this is just signals emanating from your brain. And so when we talk about creating a platform to directly interface with the brain, you have the potential just to modulate literally everything, right? Because everything is just these signals in, in terms of our experience in the world. And so that's really the short-term goal. And, and a lot of what I'm gonna focus on today um, but the way this, I, I mentioned to you, Neuralink does also fold into AI unfolding in the world in the best possible way. And so our long-term reason for existence is something that's a little bit more science fiction oriented, but like, honestly, if you look at enough enough years, you're like, yeah, this is definitely gonna be a reality. So, you know, you know, how do we how do we make this good for humanity? And that's basically when the age of artificial superintelligence hits, right? So ev every single year, artificial intelligence gets more and more and more intelligent. Of course, now that's sort of within a constrained, controllable fashion, but if you look out 10 years, if you look out 50 years, if you look at 100 years, there's no reason this technology doesn't get basically more and more uh, intelligent and more and more powerful year on year. And so uh, if you compare, contrast, you know, humans to uh, artificial intelligence or just basically silicon based intelligence, I don't necessarily know that we'll consider it artificial forever. Um, but one of the things that we have uh, is, you know, we, we've got a lot going on in our own heads, but the actual communication bandwidth between humans and between humans and computers is actually relatively low, right? So I'm 
I'm showing you some images, I'm saying some words, the bitrate on that communication is, is relatively low compared with what computers can do with each other, or even to some degree what uh, computers would be able to express to us if, if we had some sort of higher bandwidth opportunity. So, um, you know, this is one of these things that, again, it sounds way out there, but, you know, as super intelligence hits the world, one of the things we kind of want to exist is just the optionality to have a high bandwidth interface with it. So we just keep high communications and, you know, basically like allows humanity to go along for the ride. And so, you know, honestly, the probability of our, probability of us being able to do this successfully in the time frame allowed started at zero percent and so you know we literally exist to to raise that probability above zero percent um we've been working really hard for the past four years i think we've gotten the probability up to you know generously one to two percent and we just we just hope to keep um elevating it from there and so just to step back for a hot second you know like what are we talking about in the first place so your brain is an electrochemical system you've got a lot of neurons you've got billions of neurons in your brain they're connected to each other through synapses. So um, neurons have variable number of connections with other neurons, but a lot of what's happening in your brain is just basically a fundamental um, wiring and rewiring of, of these synaptic connections through time. And because the brain has uh, electrical properties, one thing we can do is uh, essentially put an electrode in the brain that allows it to hear electrical signals from nearby neurons. Um, and so that's essentially what we're trying to do. And, you know, one, one question that often comes up is, hey, you know, like, why do you have to go inside of the brain for this? And there are a lot of things happening uh, in, in terms of reading brain signals externally, but because our end goal, we have, we have two goals. One, one is to just really fundamentally help people with debilitating brain disorders. And the other is to get to that high bandwidth interface. And just basically the, the physics of how this all works doesn't allow us to get to significant enough resolution on either a read or write dimension in terms of a, a brain machine interface. And so um, it would be our preference not to have to go inside the brain, but it's just per our current understanding of physics, impossible to do it from outside. And so we're not the first ones to want to do things with the brain. So I'm just gonna quickly walk you through a couple of things that, that exist today. Uh, in terms of best in class for uh, medical research, the most popular device used to inter interface with the brain directly is called a Utah array. Um, this essentially has uh, 100 silicon sh shanks attached to a base plate. So if you look at that image on the bottom right side, um, these are, again, the you've got it two millimeters for scale there. So you've got these relatively teeny tiny, but still large silicon shanks. Um, you kind of, you rest that thing on top of the brain. You, you use a pneumatic hammer to like put it inside the brain and, and off you wrote. But um, a few things, are, are definitely constrained here. I mean, one is the fact that this has existed for a couple of decades, it hasn't really progressed. Um, and again, one of the goals of this was to just understand the brain a little bit better. The goal was never to take this to humans in a way that they could actually use uh, to either enhance themselves or to solve any any particular just brain ailment that that could be plaguing them. Um, and the other, the other tricky things about this, which again, what we look at ourselves is essentially trying to move beyond the Utah array as our first step is if you, if you take a look here, you've got these, uh, these ports that come out of the brain. Um, and any, anytime you have a percutaneous port that gives sort of like a, a very high risk of infection because you have this constantly open thing. And so from the get-go for Neuralink, it was just not an option to have anything per percutaneous, which from an engineering perspective, um, inserts a whole bunch of challenges, but they're ones that we're pretty excited to solve. Um, and then one other thing that we'll get into a little bit is just the fact that, you know, if you, if you think about your brain, people use different things like kind of like wet, overcooked wet spaghetti or yogurt, but your brain is this like fundamentally soft medium that's kind of pulsing up and down. And when we think about brain machine interfaces, we want something that's gonna last on the order of decades before you have to, to upgrade it. Um, and one material property of these silicon shanks in the Utah array is that they're extraordinarily stiff. And so when you basically have a stiff medium and a pulsating soft medium, you're, you're basically causing chronic damage to the brain through time because you kind of have a, have a sword and a, and a squishy thing that's, that's moving over and over again. So you're, you're creating a, additional tissue damage. So that's what's happening on the research side. Uh, in terms of what's happening that's clinically available, there are a few devices that Again, I think we'll look back in 10 years and consider these relatively medieval, um, which is good. It means humanity will be pr progressing, but uh, they actually, the, these fundamentally simple and invasive and actually relatively dangerous devices actually do a lot of good already. 
Um, so there basically is precedent to show that when you are able to safely put something in the brain, you can really, really help people. And so I've, I've got just one example here, which is a deep brain simulator. Um, unlike the thing I just showed you, which was a fundamentally read-based device, so it's trying to read neural signals, what this is trying to do is it's trying to inject current to essentially um, regulate certain areas of the brain that are just misfiring in, in certain ways. So uh, in this case, this is a deep brain stimulator. Uh, you can either do it unilaterally or bilaterally. This image shows a, a bilateral insertion. You put these, uh, basically these uh, stimulating electro channels deep in the deep in the brain region that's malfunctioning, and you just apply a stimulation current to regulate that area. Um, one of the downsides of this to date is that, again, because it is a bit dangerous, it's not always effective. Only people who have very, very debilitating conditions that have absolutely no other recourse are eligible to get it. So an example would be somebody who has just uncontrolled Parkinson's tremors and something like stage four Parkinson's would, would be eligible. But again, it's it, there's a very high bar for, for putting this stuff to use. And so that takes us to what Neuralink is building. This is a, this is a, a, a snapshot of what the device looks like today. Um, I'm going to call attention to a couple of things and just kind of walk you through how we got here. And so just as a, just as a fundamental backdrop here, I've, I've worked with probably a couple hundred startups in my life and, um, both a blessing and a curse of Neuralink is that I've just never seen so many different dimensions that have to come together to make a single device work, right? So, you know, in our case, if you take a look at those threads, uh, I'm gonna just hop forward one sl slide. It's a little bit difficult to tell here, but what you're seeing is 64 individual threads. Each of those threads has 16 working electrodes on it, and those connect back up into the package. And so if you were to pull up, pull off one of these individual threads and look at it, you'd have that, you would barely be able to see it. And if, if you weren't holding onto it very close, it's just this teeny wisp of hair. It's about the, a third the width of a human hair that would just float off and you'd never be able to find it again. Um, so we're trying to build something that small, something flexible, something that just kind of hides inside the brain and moves with the brain brain's material properties. And so we've ended up having to lean on a lot of uh, microfabrication experts uh, to basically build this thin film electrode array technology. Um, Again, in contrast to those silicon shanks, we were just like, this was, it was completely a non-starter for us to, to do anything that would cause chronic injury to the brain. And so that's definitely been kind of several years of work uh, of Neuralink to be able to get those electrodes thin, flexible, relatively invisible to the brain. Um, and, uh, and, and then obviously be able to integrate that with a broader uh, electronics package. So where we've gotten, basically a, the, a lot of what we've done in, in the last year or so, uh, so we've been refining everything, but one fundamental architecture change that uh, you know Elon looked at and, and insisted on is our original instantiation for this, the simplest thing we could have possibly thought of to make this work uh, was, was the image you see here. And so you see, basically uh, you, you've got these four little divots that go in the skull there, and that was just the thread and um, the, the chip that did the analog to digital conversion of the signals from the brain, um, routing down to basically uh, wireless data transfer. And then we had a battery that sat on the outside. So we would power this with a swappable battery. Um, Elon decided he was just like, look, you know, guys, we got to simplify and we got to make this completely invisible um, because he's like, I just, you know, some, somebody who has this, somebody who's going about life through this, it should, people should not be able to tell the difference. It needs to be completely invisible. And so we ended up swapping to this one architecture, which is is very clean. Um, but basically, if you think of what we're what we have to solve here, we basically have the threads that are coming off underneath that that implant. We have the implant itself, which has to house. So we've got 1,024 channels per device. So you basically have to uh, be able to convert all of the signals there, get all of the data off the head, and provide enough battery life that this is deeply functional and useful to somebody that that needs to use it. And so here's kind of the, the implant side of it, which is kind of half half of what Neuralink is focused on from, from an engineering perspective. So again, 1024 channels. What we do is we, we needed to shrink it to a size, both in terms of width and height, that basically um, fills the cavity of the skull that, that we removed to insert it, right? So it, it ends up just being another piece of your skull at the end of the day. And then what we did is create an inductive uh, charging system. So you basically, uh, you, you know, right now we have it, like this, we are working on animal models and we charge just with this little puck. 
uh, that's able to charge the implant uh, through the through the skin without raising temperature, or causing any other biological damage. And then what we'll do as we move to humans is, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure what it's gonna end up looking like, and I can use a Canadian word, which is making me really happy. You probably have like a, a charging toque. Um, I know here we have to call it beanie, which is just completely infuriating to me. So you, you basically have a charging hat that would allow you to charge it when you're not using it or continue to charge it while you are using it. Um, so that's the one half, that's the actual implant. If you move over to how do you actually get it, there's the surgery. And so, um, you know, we're looking to move to our first human patients in the next, say, six to nine months. Um, we're actually going through our uh, initial FDA process right now. Uh, and our eventual goal is to make this as easy and simple as LASIK. The first surgeries will not be that, um, but that that is the end goal. And in order to do that, one of the things, so we spend a lot of time and energy on robotics at Neuralink. Um, one of the cool things about that is, you know, I, I've had a lot of friends in robotics over the years and robots are just cool. Like they just absolutely are awesome. They're fascinating. Um, but a lot of people sometimes build robots because they're, they're fun and they're cool, but they're not necessary. In the case of Neuralink, the robot is just completely necessary for, for two reasons. Um, and reason one is I, I talked to you guys a little bit about the, the threads that we have to insert. Um, the, it basically kind of operates like how a sewing machine would work. So there's a there's a little loop at the end of the thread. And what our robot does is, uh, and, and I'll show you a video of it in just a second, it grabs each of those 64 threads and inserts them into a very specific area of the brain. And you could be the best human neurosurgeon in the world. You have absolutely no shot of doing this because you just need micron precision, right? And a human hand just cannot possibly um, can't possibly do that from a motor control perspective in the first place, but in the second place, there's just no way you'd be able to do it fast enough to be able to grab all of those threads and put them very precisely in the brain. Um, and so we we absolutely just fundamentally need a robot. Like when we devise this device, we're like, well, we can't even think of this device without thinking of a robot surgeon. And so um, just as early as we were working on the implant, we were working on the, the robotic surgeon to actually be able to implant the device. And so the rough outline of, of what happens in the surgery is, again, you have to pull back a skin flap, you have to take out uh, a, a portion of the skull, that's done by a human right now. And then you have our surgical robot come in, implant all of the different electrodes. And then you have the human kind of close up. And again, nothing percutaneous, patient looks completely normal. Um, and now let me introduce you to the robot. So as you can see, the robot has a massive base. And one of the reasons there are a few reasons why the robot's so big. So one, again, micron precision, we need a bit of weight there just to ensure that we're not wobbling all over the place. Um, thing two is we just have an insane amount of just optical technology. Again, it's it's mostly hidden by that shroud there, uh, but we have a whole bunch of different um, wavelengths of just passive optics. And then we have something called optical coherence tomography. With, and we actually have a, the, the highest resolution optical coherence tomography set up in the world. And what that allows us to do is compute a 3D map of the brain, because not only do we have to find a way to just insert around different blood vessels, but the brain's constantly pulsating. And if you want to get within a few micron precision with each of these insertions, we have to be able to very, um, very accurately track the brain in 3D space. And so I think next slide is slight gruesome alert. Uh, I'm very normalized to this, but for Anyone that hasn't seen brains before, uh, I'm gonna I'm just gonna let this play a couple of times because it, it kind of shows one of the reasons why it's just absolutely critical to have a robot. Um, you can see the vasculature on the top of the brain. And so if you think of something like a Utah array that just had that, you know, that broad bucket of spikes, when they put that in, they're just puncturing a bunch of these blood vessels. And that's terrible for a number of reasons. One, it, you know, uh, it it creates an, an acute and chronic immune response when there's just enough um, blood that, uh, let me just play this puppy again. There we go. Uh, you, you don't wanna create that immune response. What that ends up doing is your brain sends a whole, just a whole bunch of um, things like astrocytes and glia that just glom onto the electrodes um, and basically tag them as a foreign body. And they're like, no, 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 you're not doing this. We're gonna shove you out of the brain and we're just gonna coat you so you can't hurt us anymore. So you obviously can't get brain signals when your electrodes are coated. Um, and beyond that, sometimes if you do puncture one of these vessels, I mean, the blood vessels are there to oxygenate the cells. And so you're just gonna knock out an entire column of the neurons that you're trying to record from. 
Um, and so for us, the surgical robot, and again, I, I showed it to you in one quick slide here. This has been this has been many years of work to get it to be this um, precise to be able to grab uh, to grab the thread and insert it in the brain around the vasculature. Um, and so one kind of kind of interesting and funny thing about this this whole situation is, you know, you've got that robot that's just absolutely massive. The only part that interacts with the brain is that little needle, which starts its life as a, a 40 micron wide a tungsten radium piece of wire. And then we have a femtosecond later that, uh, sorry, femtosecond laser that reductively manufactures it um, with about eight different cuts into this very precise geometry that basically grabs the thread and then is able to look at the brain, insert it, pierce through the menings, meninges on top of the brain without causing damage, uh, insert that thread and then retract and do that 64 times in a surgery. And so that's all of the, uh, the the implant and robotic side of things to get this in the brain. But once we get in the brain, the question is, does it work? And so I'm gonna go over just a couple of things we've done um, to date. So in August of last year, we ended up sharing some of our uh, first large animal results. Um, and so just to give you guys a backdrop of, of how this works, you know, our, our preference of course would be if we didn't have to use animal models, the reality of the situation is, is the FDA and just in general, you, you have to test these things on non-humans before you move into humans. And the way we end up going about that is, uh, and our whole company has this ethos, anything that can possibly ever be tested outside of an animal, animal model has to be tested outside of an animal model. And so we've invested a lot of time and energy in doing things like hardware and loop testing, a lot of visual inspection on the devices, and we basically have a whole bunch of uh, chemical tests as well that we subject the implants to. Once you've done that, it's time to test in animal models. And so um, we are primarily using two models uh, right now for the, the, the human grade implant. And so the first one of those is pigs. And what we use pigs for is, is basically anything we can do that doesn't require extremely rich behavior. Uh, and so here's an example of just actual brain signals coming out of a pig. So this is the sound of thought, this is the sound of reality. Um, the way our brain communicates is in action potentials. And what we basically do, I'll show you, let me hop back to that other slide, even though it's a little bit loud. Um, because we have to have everything on head, what we've done is, is basically, so the, the models for reading things, uh, reading signals from motor cortex and actually being able to map them to useful behavior are not overwhelmingly complex. So what we've tried to do is basically shrink the footprint of uh, the chip and make it as, um, shrink the analog pixel and make it as uh, less power hungry as we possibly can. And then what we're basically doing on head is we're template matching to the shape that you see on the right in, in the blue, which is the shape of an action potential. So every time your, your uh, neuron wants to fire, it depolarizes then repolarizes and, and gives you kind of a signature shape, which we then identify on a template that we have on head. And we're essentially shipping just all of the spike data that we get and the temporal signatures associated with that. So that's that's what we're shipping off head to then run our models. Uh, and here's just a raster plot of what this ends up looking like across 1,024 channels. In this particular case, we had, so if you, if you think about a pig and it's like, what does a pig spend most of its life doing? It spends most of its life kind of rooting around with its snout, both from a tactile and scent perspective. And so what you're basically seeing here is every time you get one of these hills, we're stroking the pig's nose. Um, and for anyone who has seen our, our August event from last year, we uh, we had this kind of a, rigged up to a, a musical setup. So you basically were playing the pig's nose like a musical instrument, just to just to show the efficacy of the brain signal. Uh, we also did just a basic uh, motor fitting model. So we had piggies are very food food motivated and they're huge sweethearts. So you can see this this piggy on a on a treadmill getting some snacks. Um, she's walking and essentially we're basically fitting a model to uh, the, the motions that she's making, as you can see, predicts quite close to reality. Again, this is with a single 24 channel device in one hemisphere of the brain tracking one half of the pig's body. And so that's kind of as far as you can push on sort of like pig behavior. You can't really, really, really train a pig to do richer behaviors. Um, and so that's what we've done with pig models. So using that both to just prove that we are reading useful signals from the brain and also to just show that pig is our main model to show that there are no chronic health effects uh, that happen as a result of, of our implant. And so that's the animal model we're using in our FDA study. Um, everything from the get-go that Neuralink has created is also read-write compatible. 
I think some of our first applications in humans, which I'll get into in just a moment, are going to be read heavy, just because that's the thing that's going to be more useful in cortex-based applications that we're focusing on right now. Um, but we're, we've also just run the set of experiments we need to to ensure that we are effective writing, effectively writing information to the brain. And so the way we do this is, uh, this is done in primarily mouse models just for, for debugging. What you do is you, you end up inserting a fluorescing virus into a brain uh, and, and stimulating in a way that when the neuron fires, uh, you basically can see just light around it. So we've got two threads in here, which you can see in red. We're stimulating each of those threads and you can see the neurons associated with, or just basically proximate to that thread end up, end up firing. So we're writing information into the brain and when you zoom out, this is just essentially what you see. These are just different vertical slices of the brain, but you're seeing that when we stimulate, there is just gross neuronal activity in that region. And so one of the things we can do over time is see basically how little current we, we can inject to enact the change that, that we want to see. But just like a computer, these interfaces are, are going to be read-write compatible. So where are we right now? Um, we're focusing on a couple of things. The thing that is most important to us is safely getting a useful device to humans in need as quickly as possible. Uh, what, what we're focusing on out of the gate is helping quadriplegics get digital freedoms back, right? So anybody who just has completely lost movement um, so, south of their neck, uh, what, what they'll be able to do is essentially use a computer in the same way with the same fidelity that you or I could. Um, and again, I think the, the first patient will be able to do it with some fidelity, but there's no reason that we couldn't get to essentially, the, again, the same bandwidth that you or, you or I get. And I think the thing that I'm most excited about is, you know, getting it to the level where, you know, somebody who, you know, used to love, love video games, for example, uh, unfortunately, you know, became quadriplegic can just like whoop my ass at their favorite video game. Um, and that is of course, you know, a little bit, a little bit of a more fun application than others, but, uh, for somebody to be able to actually contribute back to society by doing meaningful work on their laptops, being able to stay socially connected to loved ones. That's the place that we're starting. And so in order to ensure that all of our systems are up to speed by the time we get to first humans, this is where we transition over to uh, monkey research, which we, again, very low numbers of monkeys. Um, these monkeys are treated super well. They're just like huge sweethearts. And what we're doing uh, primarily right now is we're inserting our devices into both hemispheres, uh, focusing on the motor cortex, and we're having uh, the monkeys do specific tasks. And so Elon had mentioned in a, in a clubhouse, inter I guess clubhouse interview presentation, whatever you call it, the cool kids are calling it these days. But he had um, shared just at a high level one thing that we have been working on, which is uh, monkeys playing Pong with their brains. Um, I won't share in too much detail right now because we're going to have something coming out in the, in the next couple of weeks. But the, I mean, it's pretty cool. Monkeys are playing Pong with their brains. Um, and so primarily we've worked on motor cortex. One thing we are also putting a bit of effort into in is also inserting these devices into visual cortex with the thought that our second or maybe third application in humans will be just visually reconstructing um, images for people who are blind. And so what that looks like right now is essentially using the devices to read the information that's coming in uh, through through the monkey's eyes and uh, basically recomputing that on on a screen so you can at least see kind of coarse imagery uh, and our goal is to improve the resolution of that over time and so yeah I just talked a little bit about you know this this final monkey demo is kind of functionally the last step on the path to humans um, we have them working on tasks like pong but we also have them working on tasks that are extremely similar to what a human's going to want to use out of the gate and so this is just a render of what the Neuralink app will look like. Uh, so there's a calibration phase where, you know, you essentially ask the patient to think, move to the right. And as it moves to the right, it trains the model. Uh, and then once you figure out right, left, up, down, what you can do is, is find our granularity and basically move in a circle like you saw here. So monkeys are currently performing that task as well, and they're doing quite well at it. Um, and then once you get beyond that, you can see you could very get a very rudimentary keyboard out there that would basically allow a human to just basically type out whatever they're they're typing out. In this case, you are using just basically sort of like 2D control with a click. Um, as we move further down the line, uh, there are existence proof to show that we might be able to shortcut a whole bunch of different things, like in the same way that you have that little swipe function in your phone, instead of just like tapping buttons and you have autocomplete, um, you could do things like that, or you could even tap into language areas of the brain 
and transcribe just basically full words or full thoughts based on neural patterns. So it's it's the future is going to get super super interesting. Um, but so that's that's really what we've been working on right now. We're just super heads down trying to see how far we can push the models in advance of getting to first human. And as I mentioned, we're going through our first series of FDA studies um, just to essentially prove that this is going to be safe and efficacious for first human. Um, and one thing I'll close on just before questions is just the like the vast array of talent types that we need at the company. Um, one of the things that's been super exciting for me is just when I, I get really excited by working with brilliant and good hearted people who are excellent at things that are adjacent to, to what I know, right? And so getting to work with the best material scientists, roboticists, neurosurgeons, um, and we have a whole bunch of just like fundamental scientists too that are dealing with the more biological side of things, um, working with the best animal animal care specialists, um, and, and again, the best folks in terms of like actually building models that understand um, like neural networks for our neural networks. Like right now it's mostly linear models just because we're working in motor cortex, but um, it's gonna get meta pretty soon, neural networks on neural networks. And it's just been, anyway, it's been it's been a super fun experience. I'm, I'm stoked to be able to, to share a, a little bit with you guys and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks so much, Siobhan. That was that was such an amazing presentation. So I'll uh, throw up some questions here now, and then. Okay. So just to start off with a more general one. So by your estimate, approximately how long do you think it'll be until healthy humans can start getting the neural implant? It's a good question. I think part of this is predicated on the what. So a lot of what I showed you guys is um, what we've been focusing on out of the gate is cortex-based application. So your cortex is obviously like at the top, it's quite accessible once you make that craniotomy, you're just basically inserting directly into the brain region that, that you want to um, read and write to. Um, for cortex-based applications, again, I mentioned quadriplegics were the, were the first set of, of patients that we were, we were going to serve in part because there's just huge need there. And in part also because there's no loss, like the, the I mean, if you're quadriplegic, you're not using your motor cortex to move your body, right? So we're inserting into unused brain just to give upside. Um, where we move beyond that, I think there are a bunch of different paths we could take. So that could get so high bandwidth that you or I may eventually want it, right? Just in terms of a direct interface with our computers. I think that's less probable um, for first applications for healthy humans. Another thing that we've been we've been thinking about and talking about a lot is a lot of a lot of the most paralyzing ailments um, for humans tend to be in deeper brain regions. So you know, PTSD, anxiety, obesity. Um, there are a lot of things that that just go get again like extreme depression to the point where you're suicidal like some of that stuff just doesn't have kind of chemical remedies um, and, and things like insomnia for example so if you're able to access deep brain regions you can treat a whole bunch of other ailments but that also may be the shorter path to translating into something that would uh, help a healthy human um, like as an example for me I'm like well I don't have insomnia but like you know, sometimes getting to sleep at night is a little bit tricky. If you had something that was truly at the invasiveness of LASIK that could help you get to bed and help you get like a full night of rest, I mean, you'd be kind of crazy not to get it, right? And so that happens to be the thing that I'm I'm particularly interested in just in terms of the first thing I would want as a relatively healthy human. A lot of people have different answers to that question. So if you were looking for something that again, just unequivocally is gonna, gonna take you to better control like of your computers and your digital devices and be your default way of interacting. You're, you're probably looking at 12 to 15 years. Um, again, pending FDA cycles and various other things like that. But if you're looking for something, I, I, have, a, I have a sneaking hypothesis that some of the, the deeper brain implants will be desired by relatively healthy pe people on a shorter time scale. Um, but again, on the earliest, you're looking at seven to 10 years plus whatever additional regulatory cycle is required to make it just like universally available. But I think the existence proof will exist in seven to 10 years. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's pretty soon, honestly, in the grand scheme of things, but yeah, it's kind of wild at like Neuralink, we think in months and people are like, Oh, what's six months out? And we're like, it's two weeks. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, the ambition that's definitely getting the job done. <laughs> um, but just to follow up to that. So have you guys actually kind of delved into some of the emotion kind of like the deeper brain stuff that you were talking about or is that something that's just not too high of a priority a little bit farther off um it, so one thing i think i didn't probably explain clearly enough is there there are a lot of folks within the neuroscience community and research that are, are targeting very specific things one of the things that we've been focused on is just there's literally a chicken and egg problem right where like 
there is no fundamental brain platform that exists. And so both our understanding and our ability to treat are just are just hamstrung right now because humanity just does not get how the brain works on mass. Um, and so for us, a, a lot of people will be like, hey, you know, do, you should, should we partner up on things? Should we do this? And we're like, guys, we can't wait. Like as soon as we have this like stable brain, brain platform that we can, you know, allow others to use or use ourselves for fundamental understanding of the brain, like that'll be sweet. We're like focused on the engineering and the biology of it right now. Um, and again, we are learning things about the brain, but it's just like, it's so early days compared to what things will look like in five to 10 years. So understanding the underpinnings of like what fundamentally governs more complex emotions, like we're just not there yet. Like I don't, <laughs> we're like a little bit there is humanity by virtue of some F fMRI and related experiments, but like, it's honestly, it's been very humbling because the brain is the thing I think humanity understands least out of like, I think for example, like the AI we've created is way, way, way in excess of how much we understand how much our own brains work, right? It's just, it's just super early. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so in terms of like app actually implementing the the Neuralink device, like how do you, you sort of touch on this a bit, but if you could go into like a little mm -hmm. bit more detail about mediating the immune response from the electrodes. Yeah, and so we talked about two things and the two things we talked about were just as much as possible matching the material property of the brain and doing everything we can do to prevent um, an, an immune response that would be caused by bleeding, right? Because that is one of the major signals to the brain response is like, is, is blood in a place where it's not supposed to be? So those are two of the things that we focused on. Um, another thing that we worked on, and again, I mentioned we have some more fundamental um, uh, biological talent at Neuralink. Uh, you can do things like coat, coat the electrodes um, in in different proteins and just basically different compounds that do also mitigate uh, immune response. Um, and you can also just do the very simple things like uh, you administer antibiotics and various other things uh, at time of surgery. But it's basically those those are the four mechanisms that we have to, to reduce overall immune response over time. Um, the histology on in, in our animals right now looks looks quite good and we wouldn't be working to take it to humans if, if the histology did not look good. Um, and honestly, I don't think we have pushed as hard as we can yet on the third thing I mentioned, which is just, again, biological coatings that mitigate immune response. But both the teeny tiny size, the material property, and the fact that we avoid all vasculature um, and move with the brain once it's in has actually, we've we've been really pleasant, I don't wanna say pleasantly surprised, like this was the design goal from the beginning, um, but the, immu the immune response is, is relatively minimal. minimal. Okay, great. Um, so I'm just picking, we, have, we got tons of great, great questions for you. So, um, okay. Good goal with the curveball. <laughs> yeah. So um, this one definitely touches on our, our theme a little bit more, but what protective measures are being put in place to avoid hacking this device? Yeah, it, this is one of those things. We've got a couple guys at the company who are um, just excellent within this domain. So one, one thing that's been funny going through Neuralink has just been we have so many brilliant people. Um, and sometimes it's not their time yet, right? Like as an example, um, we've got a guy named Joey who, who runs Neural Signals, who's been at the company for three and a half years. Um, but a lot of the early life of the company was just, you know, getting to a stable device that was high channel count. And now we're actually implanting that device in monkeys. And he's like, you know, the, the Greek god of monkey signals kind of situation. And so his time has now come at Neuralink where he's like, yes, we're doing awesome stuff with like complex brain signals. Like, great, great, it's my time. And so we actually do have a few folks at Neuralink that joined, um, you know, they're, they're great across a whole bunch of things within like EE network spectrum, but um, they're really interested in working on the problem of like, how, how do you ensure this device does not get hacked? And like, you're thinking about it, this is like kind of the most, um, of an IOT device, this is the one that like, if you hack it, it's closest to home. Um, we are, there are definitely a whole bunch of things on on the uh, the firmware software side that uh, we're doing to ensure it doesn't get hacked. The reality of the situation is our attack surface doesn't open for at least another few years. Um, and so it's just one of those problems that's going to be very, very important. But it's kind of like, again, like putting the cart before the horse. Like we need a useful device that's going to go to humans. Um, kind of, it's, it's just a problem that we will put an extreme amount of energy in starting six to 12 months. Um, but we have a minimum viable solution now that again, we've, we've pre-cleared with, uh, you know, how other medical device companies have dealt with similar types of implants. Um, but again, like 
if there are millions of people that millions of people that now have Neuralinks, uh, you just need to enter this thing as like ironclad. But it's just it's just been too early to expend extreme resources on it since it's just it's like it's not in a person yet. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so here's another one. So we have uh, what are the concerns about needing to detach the technology to prevent overstimulation? Got it, got it, got it. Okay, yeah, sorry, the second half of the question um, is super important too. So um, in terms of detaching to prevent overstimulation, I mean, this this device just obviously can be shut off at any time. Um, a lot of the applications that we're talking about out of the gate are primarily read only. And so you're not really, you're not really talking about injecting current. And if you're talking about injecting current, it's very small amounts of current. Um, and I think this is something that we're gonna have to learn slowly through time. If I look at the second half of this question, so it's when talking increasing the bandwidth, there are just a lot of things that we don't know yet, right? Um, like if, if you could write more information to the brain, what form does that take? Um, basically like how much of it is actually usable. I think one, one hypothesis for how this ends up working is there are going to be things that are richer and more information dense than traditional language. So right now, like I have these complex concepts that I'm trying to communicate to you. The most efficient thing hum humans have is like we created the technology that is language, right? And language works in written format, language works in, in verbal trans and uh, transference format. Um, but I think one, one strong hypothesis is that there's going to be an eclipsing technology to language once you have brain to brain communication. Um, it's unclear exactly how that's going to work. Um, and obviously if you were just like hardcore stimming a bunch of portions of the brain, what does that lead to? That leads to seizure, right? And so you can't have that. Um, so I, I think one of the things that's gonna happen in addition to the ability to, again, electrically write to the brain is to just have more core fundamental technologies for how information is transferred. But again, you can shut it off at any point. And again, it's just so easy to do things like one, one beautiful example of an invasive brain device today is epilepsy monitoring systems, right? And they're both read-write. I think it's the only example of a functional read-write device. But the thing that they're trying to read is just gross activity in the brain, which is a seizure, right? Um, and so one thing you can do with these devices is you are reading all the time, right? If you get any inkling that there might be some semblance of like runaway overstimulation, you just stop or you apply corrective force. And so um, preventing things like seizures is I think relatively trivial. Um, figuring out how to like cram more information into you know every signal is again, just an unsolved problem. Okay, um, so I think this may be one of our last questions, but it's a little bit more technical, but so how useful are transferable research that's been done on non-invasive BCIs, those that use EEG to the work being done yeah. with Neuralink? Um, honestly, almost not at all. And that's not to say that those things aren't useful. Like they, they are useful for understanding certain fundamental things about, about the brain on mass, but it's just like, I think the best analogy that I've heard for explaining what the difference is, is, um, like imagine a football stadium and like what kind of information you would get out of a football stadium, depending on where you are. And so if you're in a good year blimp outside, you can hear when the crowd is cheering. So like you can tell, did something massive happen in the game or not, right? So you get that level of granularity. Now let's say you're way closer and you're basically in the nosebleeds and you're standing in the back. You can hear a little bit more. You can hear what some of the people in the crowd are saying, but you, you can't hear like what the coach is saying, what the players are saying on the field, right? And so I think the difference here is that, you know, an EEG ends up being closer to that Goodyear blimp because you can, you can end up hearing what's happened. Like you, you get certain gross waves, um, but again, that's like an aggregation of, you know, many millions of, of neurons, right? And then you can get closer. You can do something called um, ECOG, which is you put like a sticker on the surface of the brain. And so there you can get to finer grain resolution, like a million neurons, right? Um, and then once you go inside the brain, you can actually just get to single neuron resolution, which is you can hear what the coach is saying. You can hear what the player is saying. And so I, I would kind of just use that analogy to show you know, what we've basically learned, EEGs, and honestly, things like fMRI fall into kind of the same category. You get a finer grain resolution of what's happening within certain brain regions on a course level. But is that going to help you actually create a decoding model for doing 2D cursor movement? Just like, it's just impossible. Okay, great. Um, so you've touched on a lot of these questions now, but and I'm trying to understand what this one is. Um, here, I'll throw this up. So can the device tell 
the difference between an abstract notion of like a left, I mean, left thought versus more concrete thought? I mean, you could, you could do it both ways, right? So the way this is going to work um, is there's going to be a, cal so there's going to be just like a course calibration phase. Like say, say, say I got the implant and I'm trying to use it for the first time. The way this is going to work is I'm going to see that little cursor and it's going to be like, the, the most efficient way is to say, think of moving your hand to the right, right? And so if you think about moving your hand to the right, or sorry, we're going to the left in, in this particular case, um, what it's gonna do is when I successfully do that, like I might, it might start doing this at first. And then as I kind of like figure out what's going on as the model figures out what's going on, it's gonna go to the left. Um, and so in, in that particular case, especially since people understand motor left, right, that method is usually used for the calibration phase, right? Which is just like, think about moving that way. You could also train it on literally anything. Like you could say, move right when you think of a canary, right? And you could train the model to do that. Um, obviously, or, or the abstract concept of left, you could do that. Um, obvi obviously that's a little bit trickier. It's a little less linear for actually like getting to your result. Um, because you know, what happens when I wanna go on a 45 degree angle, right? If I'm thinking of half canary and half hawk, that's a little bit weird. But if I have like trained myself to move right or to move up, um, I just end up getting a better result. But like the, the point, the broader point being, you can basically like, you can, you can match whatever two concepts you want if you do that in a calibration phase. Okay, so I think this will be our last one. But um, yeah, sorry, this has been a super engaging Q&A session and you've really provided some amazing responses. So um, what would you say your goal is looking for very far into the future as unrealistic as it seems? I mean, honestly, the thing I care most about, I just want AI to unfold in the world in the best way possible. I mentioned shorter term that ends up being, you know, we're gonna create this technology anyway. How do we double down on using it for net good? One reality, and this is something I like couldn't even talk about three, four, or five years ago, is is the notion of of super intelligence. It's like uh, some people think this could be incredibly dystopian. They think it could be the end of humanity. Some people think this could be incredibly utopian, right? And, and so I think one of the things that's really, really hard for us to see and predict is what set of actions can we take to just like maximize the probability that we get that good future, right? We get. I mean, utop utopia is always tricky, but like a humanity, uh, like a basically a future where humanity is actually flourishing, right? Um, and so one of the things, and I think for whatever reason, naturally growing up, I was always looking many years into the future is what can we do now? And it's actually really tricky to understand what we can do now. I mean, Neuralink is one of, I think, you know, maybe 50 actions we could take right now um, that just basically maximize the probability that um, AGI and humanity kind of can coexist in, in good possible ways. I, I mentioned I also work with OpenAI. Um, and one of the goals there is to ensure that uh, as this technology is developed, it's developed in a way that includes many parties. It's not just gonna be one person who has a runaway advantage with this kind of like really, really um, big and important technology that gets to decide what to do with it. And so I think, you know, fundamentally I have a few goals. One is that, you know, humanity as a species gets to participate in decisions made about AI, AGI as it unfolds in the world. And we have a bunch of democratizing forces um, that allow for that participation. I think two is, again, like one of the things we're working on at Neuralink is basically ensuring we get to go along for, for the ride. Like we've got, we're literally creating a species. Um, I th think even if we didn't want to create it, the, the fundamental nature of this is that what is AI? It's compute, it's algorithms, it's data, right? Like someone's gonna make it from a game theory perspective. Um, and so having mechanisms like, uh, you know, a high bandwidth brain machine interface that allow us to stay very close to this thing, I think is kind of just super amazing and important. And I also think just from like a humanity perspective, you always want just diversification of um, continued existence um, and essentially enough inspiration to get you through the day. So it's like, you know, some of the stuff I work on is like, how do we prevent bad things from happening? But then some of the other stuff is just like, hey, like, it's so much cooler to wake up when humanity's trying to solve a whole bunch of inspiring problems. And so whether or not you're working on climate change, making life multi-planetary, um, or, you know, just like future of like AI created or human created art, like we just need good reasons to, to wake up every day, even, even in a scenario where, you know, kind of technology has taken just a different direction. So um, I think uh, my goals, as I, as you've kind of seen from this answer are like somewhat diffuse, but there's just like a whole array of things where you're just like, oh man, we can like increase the probability the future's gonna be like awesome. Um, and so I just basically try and divide my time and hours on as many of those things as I can like productively help. 
Yeah, great for sure. I mean, AI definitely has the power to increase the quality of life across all avenues for sure. So uh, I'd love to just give another huge thanks and to say that it's such a crazy, revolutionary, innovative company. And it's just astonishing how far AI has come to actually be able to implement such a precise interface with complex of our bodies. It's just amazing. Um, so a great way to cap off the conference.